I have no idea why it's happening, guys. I need just one right. second. We actually live in uh, uh, in Facebook. Or yes, on Facebook. We have, we have Tell our Facebook friends, uh, hey, we uh, we will be with you in a moment. We, we need to make sure that our YouTube people are also online. And now we're yeah. live. Again. Here we go. <laughs> Finally. All right, so looks good. We're live. So everybody who is watching, uh, welcome. It has become a tradition now uh, to meet uh, with you online every Wednesday and tell you some interesting stuff about the scaling and organizations and adoptions and Scrum and less different things. We had uh, recently a podcast on less huge we had a podcast on less adoption journey we had a podcast on team re responsibility and ownership and today we are very happy to have your hand raise your hand your hand yeah that's your hand you and mark <laughs> with us today Welcome, guys. and we're gonna yeah and we're gonna talk about a uh, learning organization what what there is and how less helps or what's the place of less in building up a learning organization? I'm really eager to know what that is because it's a buzzword. Like like everybody wants to be learning organization. Everybody values feedback and stuff. But what exactly that means? Like we are me and Evgeny, we work in Scrum Ukraine. We do a lot of classes. Are we learning or organization <laughs> or are we a teaching organization <laughs> rather? So what is learning organization and what is not? Um, so I usually start this uh, podcast with a question uh, that helps you, you guys to tell your story a little bit. My typical question is like, how did you, like, what's your story about Les? Like, how did you meet Les in in this uh, reincarnation, right? And uh, like, how did, how did you become uh, asso as associated to it? And uh, yeah, just uh, tell me how it happened. Let me uh, let me go start. and I give it to you, Mark. So, uh, how did I come to Les? Is uh, before Les was known. So I think the term Les is coined in 2015. So when I saw it popping up on uh, the Facebook of Boss, and then I wanted immediately to be involved. Uh, but before that, we could always already say we we actually went less alike. I won't say less, but at least less alike. <laughs> I started my journey in Scrum in uh, 1998, to be honest, so by accident. Uh, by accident, and then uh, somewhere when we were bought by a bigger organization, I was work employee number 12, so in the beginning it's pretty easy, it's a very small organization. And then we were acquired by a big organization, that's generally how big organizations innovate, they buy innovation. Um, so then we came in this huge team. And, uh, and and the scaling came into part. So it's like, yeah, you do some great stuff there with a small bunch. Can you also do it with another bunch of people? And it's like, oh, fuck, how is this going to happen? So, um, I, and I went to mainly, to be honest, systems thinking and lean thinking as practices to guide me around. So, so how do I now use this kind of scrum thingy around with, with, with a bigger population? And by, by default, I came out to, uh, to let's say, multi-team Scrum. I won't say less, but multi-team Scrum approaches in that sense. Um, later on, I, I got uh, involved or I got uh, introduced to Robin Diamond, which uh, you also are very familiar with, Alexi. So Yeah, he's my mentor, uh, right? Yeah. So when we were trying to get it into a bigger population, I think 2011 or 2010, I, I actually was like, yeah, you know, we don't have enough of capacity or skilled capacity, let's put it like this. We don't have enough skilled capacity to, to really get it going into the different sites that we had. I, I was helping out with five different sites in Europe to wow. actually go into this list, this kind of lesser like approach. It's like, we don't have skills enough. So Robin came in to, uh, for teaching, so not learning, but teaching at the, at the <laughs> uh, Later on also as a, as a mentor coach uh, in that sense, and then going more less from teaching, more, more on learning in that sense. Uh, and a couple of other coaches like uh, Deborah Hartman, uh, Yves Van Uy, uh, so a couple of other coaches helping out in that sense. So well-respected people with more skills and experience than I have. And this is what you should do as a, as a manager. You hire people that are more skilled than you are, and then you let them go. <laughs> so this is what I did. And I learned a hell of a lot. 
So I learned on how to minimize structures, how to keep things simple with a population of 500 plus people. Um, I got bored in, uh, in ACFA. Um, at a certain moment in time, I had to repeat myself. And the only time I, I spent time with my peers, and this is where I needed to spend time to be able to grow product definition, as you want to call, or grow the, the definition of DON uh, from this perspective. I only saw my peers like once every quarter. Uh, within my own organization, I didn't have that much to do as a, as a manager. So, as you know, you had a product owner, an area product owner, a scrum master, and, they, and the teams were doing all the stuff. So I didn't really have much to do. So I was pretty much bored. I, I did part-time management for a 500 plus organization then, uh, which is fun. And then I started doing teaching in other organization and mentoring also in organization. I had more fun outside than inside. Um, and then I did similar things. I initially thought, let's copy paste, you know? It's a bit like, like other frameworks. You know, it works successful for me at Aqua, and I spent 12 years in an adoption here. So I copy paste whatever I learned, and I put it on another organization. It will work <laughs> tremendously. Good things going wrong. <laughs> so my, my first kick as a full consultant in that sense, self-employed, went really berserk. I tried to copy paste, it don't, didn't work at whatsoever. I needed to relearn stuff in the context where we had. Again, a good pointer towards learning organizations we go to. But at the end, we came again to a lesser like situation. And I met Bas before, I read Bas's books uh, before and was really intrigued in how those things are working. We shared some ideas in, at conferences, so Scrum gatherings, Agile uh, 2000, blah, blah things. So we shared ideas on this. So. When he came up on his uh, Facebook, yeah, we're going to do a launch less as really as, as a framework. I was like, okay, I need to be there. So in 2015, I immediately uh, approached Bas. Then uh, he came with a case study. Okay, you know what? I had two or three case studies laying down. Uh, and then it's just like, uh, for which of those case studies can I actually announce the name? Uh, the thing is, I'm, I'm pretty proud about descaling organizations, getting into learning organizations, generating impact. And uh, I don't like to go outside with case studies where I cannot announce the name of the organization. I think that's that's a bit silly. So if you generate impact, then at least the organization should be okay with you talking about them. Um, if they are not okay about you talking about them, then I question if the impact was there, yes or no. So, but this is how I get to less. So gradually from system thinking, mean thinking, and then okay, boss. So this is a, in a nutshell, there's more to it, but I leave it to Mark now. Mark, so what's uh, what's your journey uh, to the less community? Like, how did you end up being here with us on this webinar? <laughs> yeah, so in 1998, I went to high school. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start from the beginning. You were born in yeah. So uh, I was uh, getting into that area a bit later. Uh, now I, I started working with Scrum in 2012. Um, basically, I was. Um, they asked me for an innovation project to be the architect. I uh, was a developer before, and they said, oh, we need a new platform for this. And, and I can explain much, much more about that uh, if you want. But um, can you also do the project management? I figured, yeah, OK, let's try that. And then someone said, let's try that Scrum thing. <laughs> so we gathered people around, and we put, got actual users as a product owner. and. That worked better. I wouldn't call it Scrum anyway right now, but the closer collaboration, fixed team together, doing everything, and a user as a product owner, that stuff was really great. And I kept building on that. And I became a manager later in the same company. And um, I had a lot of struggles. And I figured, OK, let's try to do this team-based thing, because I saw Teams as the foundation block. And one of my colleagues said, Ah, oh, you should go to the training of Boss because that's really amazing. Uh, you re really learn a lot from that. And uh, I went there and I was amazed by, okay, so there's a lot for me to learn. Um, it, I think if you ask the people around me after that, that I was like this high in energy for a couple of weeks. But I, it helped me really in. in trying to do th things differently, keep experimenting. And after a while, I realized that I like this part much better than uh, being a manager. And I also started working in the consultancy in, um, in organizations, especially large ones, mostly. And um, 
basically my my experience with less is one I would say a failed less adoption which is really which you can really learn a lot from uh, and really in depth in one uh, right now um, and since that also uh, a candidate less train which I'm really happy of because I really like the system thinking and this bigger picture and, and making organizations simpler to to earn more value basically. So that's that's how I came into it. Okay, so uh, sounds good. We should really be diving in into the topic of our podcast. But be before we go there, I have a very stupid uh, favor to ask you. Could you guys pronounce your names in your own in your in your own native language? Like, how does this <laughs> sound actually? Jürgen. Ah, well, I need to go first. Uh, Jürgen Desmet. Jürgen Desmet. Sounds good. Or? Yeah. Then again, it's a German name with the to it might be Jürgen if you, you go to the origin, but anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it is Jürgen in your, in your language, right? Yeah. Okay, Mark? But you can say Kurt, you know? Also? All right. Yeah, you yeah. can say Kurt, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, how do you read your name, your full name? My full name is uh, Mark Ayen de Klein. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll call you Mark if you do. <laughs> <laughs> For the time being, it's really hard for for yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, Mark and Jurgen, uh, we have a topic: original design, uh, original descaling towards learning organization, right? So I have two questions. <laughs> <Descaling>. Very simple. <laughs> First, what is descaling? What is basically <laughs> what is a learning organization, right? So let's start somewhere. Like, why descaling? Why do you need to descale something? And how is it different to? I don't know, scaling? Like everybody is everybody speaks about scaling these days, right? You, you, like because I mean I think it's cool to have these big scaling cases. It's cool to be a manager with uh, hundreds and thousands of people under you, right? It's it's about scale, it's about your ego, it's about your status, yeah. it's about your power. How do you sell this scaling to people? It, it's not a good sell, right? I mean nobody wants to be this scale. So I understand it's like going from large to small. Or is, it, or is it something else? Yeah. To be honest, I think it might be even both. I think many organizations out there should ask themselves the question, why are we that big? Now, in many organizations we see as well, we have, I don't know, 800 employees uh, that we pay for every month. And then if we ask, like, if we now have uh, something to validate in, in one month time, can we actually put something out there in a month? They were going like, no. It's like, yeah, but why do you have 800 people if you cannot deliver anything, not even a small thing within a month? That's, that's you know, it sounds sounds a bit silly. So maybe you should have a smaller organization and at least be able to deliver something. <laughs> so they, they have to fire them, right? Uh, <laughs> no, no, not <laughs> necessarily. I would not go into firing. The thing, but this is, this maybe maybe for some of the organizations, it means indeed some of some getting smaller to actually become better again. Um, for many organizations we work with, it's descaling means we are descaling the complexity that the organization has okay. built up over time. Horizontal complexity, vertical complexity, spatial complexity, technical complexity, and descaling it down to something more simpler. So, and simplicity is, is the key factor to become also this kind of learning organization. And people that, organizations that endure into this kind of simplicity will reap the benefits later on. And I think this is the main, main, main key idea behind it. Right. So, uh, Mark, let I me, still want to say something. Let me d d dive into what you said, and then I, I pass it to Mark, if you don't mind, just to keep this discussion deep and focused, right? You've mentioned two or three different types of complexity now, Jürgen. Vertical, horizontal, what, what was that? Uh, diagonal? No, Spatial. No. Spatial. <laughs> Could you explain to all of us what those are, please? So horizontal is more in the like reducing the complexity in the different departments and silos that that are available there, and the vertical is more in reducing the roles, for example, and other structures that prevent fast decision making. The spatial one, to be honest, is is really like go more collocated, reduce the 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 amount of different ways. And spatial can also mean we go more in a full remote, like Corona times. To be honest, mm -hmm. I'm one of those agile coaches that doesn't mind that much for some reason. Ooh. I've always been intrigued, like how can a full remote agile <laughs> still work? Because mm -hmm. I truly, be I still believe, and today I'm more convinced than before, to be honest, that collocated is working 
a hell of a lot better than full remote. Mm. But we can improve on the full remote, and we, we, we might even find ways to, uh, to become closer and closer, even though we have a big difference today. And I like the challenge of this gap, so I'm trying to figure out, can we close the gap somehow? Um, but you know, this is the spatial part as well, and the technical complexity I don't need to elaborate on, I guess. I think everybody understands uh, the technical, uh, I would say depth, but it's not depth, it's, it's really technical misery they created over time, most probably due to pressure. So we need to reduce this complexity so that we can work with multiple teams at once on the same similar things and deliver faster into the future. So it's it's a lot on, on that aspect. So this is the, the levels of complexity. All right. Good enough for you, Alexi. Yeah, thank you. That, that yeah, helped yeah. me a lot. Vertical, horizontal, spatial, and technical. I will actually remember that. Mark, what is your, your take on uh, the scaling? Uh, yeah, I think Jürgen also already said that. Uh, but I think you want to scale, but you want to scale value and customer happiness. Uh, what you want to descale is everything that you need to do that. Because if you descale the rest and make it simpler, mm -hmm. it's easier to, to reach that value or customer happiness. Because you come closer, you, you can better um, adapt to whatever is needed. So in a nutshell, I would say that that's why descaling. And um, yeah, it's on a lot of levels. I think in detail, you can even get more categories than that. Uh, but yeah, for example, you said about the, the, the vertical. Um, in a recent company I was in, it was said by the CEO, okay, decisions take too long. I heard about some decisions two months later than people ask. Because there were too many people involved and the, the decision was postponed. He said, I want that decision taken as low as possible because those people know about it. Uh, and we can't have that if we have too much complexity there. Mm -hmm. Every delay of decision uh, in your product is, is, yeah, is bad for you and, and will not give you the benefit that you want. So that's an example of the, the Okay, life. thank you. What okay. about the learning organization, guys? Is it somehow related to the Peter Senge concept of learning organization or it's something else you're talking about? Sure. Can I start now? Or? Because uh, otherwise, all the grass <laughs> will be uh, gone. Yeah, it's hard to beat him. Yeah. So no, that's okay. Uh, you will for sure add things to what I said. Um, yeah, we, we work for the company called Co Learning, and that's for a reason. Um, we really believe in this these things in the agile world, right? If if done well, but we in in principle we think it's all about learning. Whatever is now currently important. If, whether it's lean in the past or even a lot of things in, before that, it's about that keep as an organization constantly learning, but also as people constantly learn and do it together. Um, because that way you can always change to whatever is needed for your uh, challenge or your purpose and for your customers. So that that's why this learning organization and I really like uh, when I was in uh, in the university, I also uh, got. Uh, theory about Peter Senji and also his systems thinking and stuff like that is really intriguing in this learning organization. Um, but I think we're more practical, we take a more practical approach. So we just try to keep learning, let teams learn, let people learn so you don't need all this complexity. And that's basically the foundation of that. And if you don't learn and don't improve, I think then there is a problem. So uh, that, that, that's what I would call it in a nutshell. Jürgen, do you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, I think learning is key to survival. Um, definitely in the market. If you don't learn how the market is shifting, then you, you're going to die as an organization. If you as an individual don't learn new skills over time, definitely in the technology industry, then you're going to be unemployed over time. Let's put it like this. Before you get unemployed, you will first get highly paid and then unemployed. Yeah. It's like the <laughs> mainframe developers. You're very exceptional, so highly paid and then poof, done. <laughs> Um, so, but you know, it, learning is key. And uh, if you build an organization that can learn faster than any competition on market needs, on problem demands, on new technology, then you will outcompete them as well. And that's why uh, uh, learning is, is a key element of optimization if we go into organizations and help them around. So it's, uh, it's a key element. That's also a detail why we call it co-learning, collaborative learning, continuous yeah. learning. C um, could you please be, uh, guys, 
probably a bit more specific uh, when you say about the learning because learning organization uh, pretty complex thing right it's it's probably connected with the different domains. Explain like a specific behavior of learning organization. If you like imagine it, how the learning organization behave in its whole and in its part, I would say like this. Anyone would like to start? Yeah, yeah you can do it or you, Mark. Uh, please go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, let, let me start with with learning on on what you, if if your investment that you do is actually worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Let's start with this. Really, from a from a business perspective, and then we go into other aspects. Um, so, if I if I would invest, uh, let's say ten teams, and every team has five people, that's fifty people, two week iteration, that's five hundred mandates. If I invest five hundred mandates, then at least within this two week time frame, I want to learn if my investment is worthwhile or not before I continue investing in another 500 mandates of, uh, of, of investment without understanding if it's useful or not useful. So in that sense, we need to, we need to create or descale organizations in that sense, that's where descaling comes in. We need to descale organizations that within the same structures, very simple structures with fast decision making, that we can within this simple structure, within a short time frame, can put something into production so that we learn if it's useful or not, with a minimal investment and not with huge investment, you can you can you can think now this is a lean startup. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, lean startup is maybe on on discovery on products, but also in new features you need to learn if it's useful or not, either to continue and put more investment in this yes or not. So this is part of the learning. Whatever we do, does it have an impact? Does it have effect in the market to our users, to our top lines, bottom lines, whatever? So is there something useful being done? So and that's that's one part. And then if you more look at from a team perspective, for example, learning from a team perspective, and I'll we'll throw the ball to Mark and hopefully Mark can catch it and continue. So from a team perspective learning, Mark, here you go. Yeah, so uh, from a team perspective it's it's quite easy, right? So organizations that want to grow their sales and make their customers happier. What do they usually do? They buy new people, hire new people, um, take take like vendors to do stuff. So what what do you need to do on team level? You need to constantly learn because you want to be able to adapt whatever is needed. And if you don't, you constantly have to hire new people and maybe fire other people because they don't have the skills anymore that you actually want, which is which we would never recommend basically because people are able to learn. That's why I. I totally hate this resource management. When I started working, people called it resource management and I figured, what is, what is it what you're talking about? Yeah, we're talking about the people and who's working where and figured, so we are resources. <laughs> so that was really strange to me. And then in the last training, was great examples of, about how people are not resources and we shouldn't um, treat them that way because people are able to learn, especially in teams. teams should be cross-functional, right, and cross-component, um, should be able to learn constantly, but they can learn from each other, within the team mostly, but also from others. So if you want to keep working on the most important stuff that the market has need, needs, um, you should be able to learn. And you're going to explain it quite well in this training, uh, I think, and if I say it wrong, please uh, correct me. But he says, like in many organizations, the learning money is paid at the start when you want to start something new or when you want to do something different. In real good agile, cross-component, cross-functional teams, you pay learning money every day a little bit, but you are able to adapt to whatever you need. And that's, that's what I think is important on a team level, that you support the people to be able to learn with a strong vision, strong knowledge, also good technical practices and all the, the supporting environment. Um, to be able to learn. And if you do that, then you're able to get the market feedback because I think we usually use the word feedback for learning when we talk about products and how happy customers are. Um, so that's that's what I want to add about team. And we should be, this should to be... Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So from what you're describing, it seems like you need to descale to be able to learn faster. 
I'm still trying to understand what where this connection is coming from. Can you not be learning if you're not simplifying? Can you build a learning department, or do you need to descale organization so it learns? And I have another question, but um, maybe you can answer them together. Um, so basically, and my second question is. I mean, you've probably seen different organizations, right? As as coaches or managers, as you describe your career, what was the most impressive descaling you've seen? I don't mean like uh, firing thousands of people, right? I mean, like simplification that really opens some potential of a company. Oh. So that's why I'm asking these questions to, together because uh, maybe with a story or something, you can help us see how one is linked to the other. So you I will start with uh, with base company and then I will throw the ball to Mark because Mark took over some of the descaling that I initiated in the past and being in this line of not really less but less huge now. So and he can take over from there. Um, so if I look at base company, after my ACFA past of 12 years adoption, uh, base company as a telecom operator came in as well. Um, and how did we go beyond and go towards descaling? Initially, we were hired by the uh, um, IT director. So at the end, he made his own position obsolete, by the way. He still contributed into the environment, uh, but in a different role. I will come back to this. So, but we are hired. And the first thing we asked is like, why do you want to go agile? Because, you know, in the past, it was really bottom up and people understood why agile. Today, they, they just say, okay, we need to be agile, but they don't understand the reasoning or the impact of their, their sentence. So I want to explore this. He came up with good reasons. And then I asked him as well, which kind of agile do you want? Uh, project-based agile or more domain product-based agile and he was like i have no clue and i tried to give them the the pros and the cons of both uh, i'm biased you know i'm a bit biased so i don't like that much of the project i, I also mentioned this to him yeah, i'm biased but anyhow i will do my best i still was like i don't know so what did we do we, we did start both so we did start one which is more on descaling, a one that actually uses agile practices. I won't say mindset, but agile practices in a project approach, which is not descaling that much. So we did this both on the same day, on the same track. So both coached by different people, to be honest. I don't go into a project. I coach the other one or mentor the other one. Um, so and we, before the start, we had an inquiry sent to the stakeholders and the people benefiting from, from the different things. So we had some kind of starting point of measurement. And then after three months, we did the same inquiry. And we saw from the domain approach where we did the scaling on the things like that, that uh, we had a bigger, bigger, bigger impact and that people were more satisfied, a lot more satisfied than with the project impact. That's when they decided to go with more of the domain approach, more of a lesser-like approach. That's the moment I didn't talk about less. The moment they say we want this, that's the moment I also said that this is less. You know, you want less, and actually with your size, it's going to be less huge. Uh, that's when the discussion came in. So we grew areas. We added the overall product backlog, to be honest, initially without overall product owner. Uh, this is a pattern I see often in larger organizations where there was a huge top-down pressure and hitting people on the head and, and bashing, also in on sourcing companies, by the way. So bashing, then the, the moment you say, who's going to be the overall product owner, that's like the 30 second get, rid of, get out of the room question. It's like, as soon as you say this, they're like, Woof. why? Because they understand if I'm taking the ordering of the overall backlog, then I'm really at the steering wheel of 600 people behind me. If I make the wrong yep. decision <laughs> in the past, you... So, so we facilitated the overall product backlog ordering together with, at that moment, temporary fake area product owners and a couple of scrum masters like myself. We facilitated that this is happening until it showed its benefit and then the overall product owner came in. But while we were facilitating this overall product backlog, they had still had a 25 headcount PMO office. But by redirecting the attention towards working software, integrated increment, having the overall backlog, as a, as a guiding mechanism towards multi-team refinements, then this PMO office became less and less important. So it gets less and less attention. Even people in the PMO office were like, yeah, you know, what are we doing now? Why are we doing this? Um, so they were actively asking to, to change their own behavior and their own roles. And I think after one year and three months or one year and a half, something like that, the, we, we had, the, the complete PMO was disappearing. Some of them went into what still was separate as a business. Some of them really went into the teams and used their skills and, and techniques and their expertise 
to support the team organizations in that sense as some of them to be honest were so um, attached to their title that they just left the company but we absorbed so because of the different attention to really progress a higher level of transparency on progress of building software having shorter feedback lives so the learning organization in place you get less of a need on a PMO and then this disappears over time. So this is a bit of complexity going away where you get faster feedback cycles, faster decision making as well. So and this is based company. If you want more, there's still more on the less.works case studies as well. And actually there's a recording there from the former IT director explaining this together with me. So then you, you will hear the full story, but that's in a nutshell on giving you an example from reality on what goes away and why it goes away. Yeah. Yeah, so let me get back first to your first question it was about how what is important in descaling and uh, I think we will handle technical excellence hopefully and otherwise we'll introduce it later but that's very important. But the other one um, Jürgen mentioned a, a bit was about uh, your product definition and your product complexity. So. Um, um, I actually have an example which was not good and why it prevented learning. So um, I was in one of these big transformations which you see all the time now that uses terminology like tribes yeah, yeah. and Spotify. squads. And, and Inspired that kind of Spotify, they're saying. <laughs> yeah, I tried to stay away from all those, those uh, names. But, uh, <laughs> um, and what they usually do is they make like component teams. So really, I was really in an infrastructure um, hardware part, and they made parts of the product which had product owners and were on a product. But to deliver something to a customer, you needed like many of those teams. So what happened was those teams individually only learned their own component which is specialization, which is good. But what is not good is that it's single specialization. So it's not helpful for your uh, customer. So what happened? These product owners were all the time coordinating between who needs what work. On top of that, they, of course, invented new roles, which were basically project managers disguised as something else. And what you get, and, and all, all complexity around it, all communication, all coordination, and what happens is that that like delivery will go slower. Um, everyone will scream, and the pressure gets higher. But the learning is less, and the value is less. Um, so this this is often basically just project thinking in this kind of organization. So that's one part. So therefore, the product definition, a bigger product like Jurgen described, is a lot better because then people understand where they need to learn mm -hmm. uh, uh, to to work. And how can we increase the value by learning something new? Um, and then at least you give the environment to do that. Um, and then to your second question about an example of, of how it's going, uh, Jürgen mentioned already the, the company I work for right now um, is, is a, around 400 people company with 150 people in the product development. And um, they came, when Jürgen came in, from like this silo based component based uh, working and they said we want to grow faster but we struggle with a lot of things uh, one of them was also technical excellence which they also solved a lot about but let's go into that in a moment and they started basically investing in new teams which in the beginning didn't mm -hmm. deliver much because People were all new. It was really hard for them to understand what was this bigger product that they're delivering. But because they were in those teams, eventually, and it took took a while, they kept learning and they kept delivering more value. And I think that's that's a good example of making the, the complexity less because they don't didn't have all those managers anymore. They didn't have all those project managers that were coordinating, and people were really thinking about what do I need to do to be able to deliver more. So that, that's I think one of the, the the best examples I've seen at least. Thank you. I think the the key element that Mark is mentioning, you can see this also for the governmental institute of pensions here in Belgium, their IT department. So they also did the. Uh, LS adoption, six teams out of 17, by the way. So, uh, and this requires integration from within the LS bubble towards the rest of the organization. 
for this we kickstarted the, together with the people of course and they carried out we just help it's always the organization itself now we kickstarted what they call the no more majors community meaning we're going to get rid of about, uh, our major releases so we do two major releases a year we're going to stop this we're going to stop having two major releases we're going to have two weekly releases <laughs> in december and we were in june <laughs> at that moment in time so and this was their their purpose of existence as a community and we work together with also not the less related targeted uh, organization but also the others to actually make it happen and this became the main driver of simplification so having the technical capabilities to work with 70 teams and deliver every two weeks an integrated increment into production is driving the simplification of many other things. Why? It drives the attention away from the project management and budgets to the value being delivered. And then you don't do cost management, you do value management in your organization. And then lots of the complexity that has been added over time becomes obsolete. Uh, and this is, a, this is really a, a major aspect. So Mark uh, briefly says technical excellence. Well, I think it's in descaling organization and becoming learning organization one of the crucial factors to get there. So did they in the end reach the goal of of releasing every every two weeks uh, I, to December? I, I could now be very annoying as tell you you know what go and watch the <laughs> webinar recording we did, but I will not. <laughs> yes, they did. And I'm, I was very happy because later on as well, they kept on growing. And I think uh, in uh, February this year, so before the lockdown, we, we actually invited as a governmental institute in Belgium, which is very exceptional. We could invite other, uh, other organizations into a viewing real reality. So they really went with an open door visit. And mm -hmm. people from Wysoft came there, people from Fluvius came there, people from uh, the Czech Bank came over there. So really like many other people came and looked like, okay, where are you at? So, and I think this is, this shows the impact and effect towards people. People feel a lot happier. If you generate this kind of impact, they are proud about what they achieved. So, and then it's, it's, it's nice that they open the doors and actually also show it to others. So be inspiring to others. Uh, and if I can add one thing about uh, about that because it's related. Um, so what what they did in my current company was they actually shared the pain, and that's actually quite a good uh, practice to encourage learning. So before they had a release team that did releases. Now we expected every team to do releases. Why? Because they feel the pain and they're going to improve it. Uh, the support was component based. Now we have said no. One team has support per sprint. Mm -hmm. Um, and they need to learn from each other how to deal with other issues. So they lear learn the product better. Uh, the same thing with regression tests. Why were they not automated? Because they were in a separate department and that was their reason of existence. So mm. they had to do the regression test each, each release. They figured, oh no, that's not what we want. And they, they, they try to improve it and, and automate it. So if you make sure that these pains are shared, Teams will find ways to make it simpler and better because you have more time to do other stuff. You have less problems with, for example, releasing. Um, so it, it helps you in scaling value, basically. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, I really like where this where the discussion is going. Like we spent about half an hour discussing like the whys of the scaling and the wise of learning, right? And now we are switching to how, right? And you have this be, be, be beautiful, inspiring example of a company that went from, did you say it, it was like two releases a year, Jurgen, yeah. two releases every two weeks, and it's a it's a Belgium pension fund. So it's a, it's a, it's in relation with the history, with a legacy and all that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. So they used to be uh, mainframe stuff and all related to that. So they have legal requirements because if there is a shift in minister of pensions wow. in the political scenarios, then they also shift in uh, regulations and all of other stuff. So all of this misery is there. So which is which is fun to work in. So it's a very cool example. I'm not sure how fun it is to work there, but I, I. I trust you saying that uh, maybe you can also manipulate your pension a little bit and then makes it more interesting or ah, damn I forgot about that <laughs> and it's about every 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 person that is listed as a Belgian uh, uh -huh. country in, in this country is being affected with whatever they do so, right. so this is also very regular it's also very 
very risky because if I make a mistake and it goes out of the door, I might risk that maybe, I don't know, 100,000 people get their pension calculated or, or being paid out <laughs> in the wrong manner. Wow. You can imagine which kind of tom tom this would be in the newspapers and all the rest <laughs> of it. So this is a factor to take into account if you descale. Yeah, course. super a super cool example because with with Yevgeny, we have observed or noticed rather people having this idea that yeah, multi team scrum or less, it's cool, but, but but it sounds like it's something you should apply and you must be apply only for product yeah, like, organizations like uh, yeah. startups and whatnot. But like pension fund where you actually using the system to pay out pensions for the entire uh, country now nah, maybe you should use something uh, a little bit more well described and stuff like that right so i'm really interested in hearing more ideas or maybe more steps along the journey like from june to december like what what happened how like what were the key key things that actually happened there if you may un uncover a little bit of uh, yeah, yeah, the you story. Know. They, they went to the last conference in Munich uh, in September and explained themselves uh, together with our technical coach so how things went. So I can freely announce it, I hope. And they visited, they invited others to show. So I can share many things here. Uh, the thing is, the journey started way before we, we came on the scene. Mm. Uh, I think, I don't know how many years ago they started with just trying out Scrum, uh, a more of an agile approach of working. And this is like, like many other organizations, we scale Scrum teams. We have one team product on the Scrum Master and we have many of those. Um, and then and then we have certain people that are doing analysis and they would the sprint before the development and all of that stuff. So they improved a bit on their workings, they improved a bit on collaboration, um, but they also felt at a certain moment in time this is not working well. Then they, they the cause of the misery is always put on the manager. So the organization went to the managers need to change. So they went to management 3.0 trainings and tried some of those practices. It didn't work very well as well at that moment. It improved a bit, but not tremendously. But at least at that moment you also have management included in this this trying to figure things out. Now uh, in their complexity that they have to live in. Uh, and then they said, okay, we need to we need to look more at scaling and at building our own framework. And I love the idea of building their own frameworks, by the way. So you don't need to copy paste. That means they want to learn how it fits in their context. I, I don't like organizations where they say, okay, what is the framework and then copy paste. Copy paste is never going to work. Anymore. So they went to... So they went to they went to a safe course. So the four day safe course with twenty plus people. Uh, then they came to they also had an internal last course from myself uh, for uh, twenty plus people. And then they were thinking like, okay, we go to the extremes, and then we built our own. Uh, this was their idea, and they came uh, two months later. They they called me and said, okay, you know what? We came we came with our own ideas, and we always come back to less anyhow. So we're going to do less. And that's the moment when we joined their crew and then we did some analysis. And I think the analysis is a, is a crucial thing. So we we investigate like how fit how fit are we and what do we need to prepare before we can actually um, do a team shuffle or do a less kai kaku or a flip event, for example, uh, a flip forward event. So uh, we analyze the technical part from within the code. You know, code never lies, comments sometimes do. So we use things like GORS, for example, to examine to commit loss and see, okay, how is things being spread, which kind of technologies are being used. And we do this remote or with not that much interference of local people. Why? To build our initial ideas of assumptions, which we then validate in conversations. Uh, going into a conversation just blindly without any, any assumptions in your head is, is not going to be that effective. So we do this kind of analysis on the code, but also in their Jira environments, you know, everybody is using Jira as soon as they start with Scrum. Um, so we, we explore their Jira environments, we explore their wiki environments, then we get assumptions and then we validated those assumptions with them um, and built a future vision. Also made sure that the person, the manager that gives a mandate understands very well what, what kind of delegation level that's, that would be needed to get there. And now we slowly start preparing. And one of the, the things of preparation towards less, because you cannot flip around six, six teams that need to integrate with 17 others uh, without considering how the integration and technical part will be. So you, you, this would never work. And if we would turn it around and we need to follow up on the 
two year uh, delivery cycle, then we didn't have any any benefit and learning whatsoever. And then we would just execute upon a plan anyhow, no matter what kind of framework. So this we didn't really want to. So we kickstarted this no more majors and then Tom and a couple of our technical experts took it, took it along um, to have this done by December. And then the first turnaround into a lesser like structure with six of the teams out of the 17 was done in January. So this is six months of preparing towards January where we next to the technical track, define product a bit more, define uh, skill sets a bit more. So all of that stuff, prepare people, educate everyone. And then really the flip itself is really doing initial product backlog refinements, team self-design, sprint planning, and off you go. So and from that moment on, you start learning on how to, how to operate better uh, in these refinement sessions to collaborate better across teams, which is tough. The lucky part over there, they have a tremendously very good Scrum Master, uh, Scrum Master product owner. They also have good Scrum Master, yeah? let's be honest. But the very good product owner. So Aud, she is called, you can look her up. Aud is really tremendously good. She was consuming this, she was going into this with a blank sheet, really as a blank sheet, not opposing. So learned a lot along the way, built a very strong vision and strategy that she aligned with many of the other departments. It's it's governmental, so there's lots of alignment to do. Uh, protected the teams as well from this, communicated very transparency, also transparent on the learning that being achieved, so that it's not being pressure, pressure, pressure constantly, but absorbing the change and the variation, which is normal to be there. So, and this is this is one example. Oh, uh, you asked for uh, for the governmental institute. Here you go. Time wise, today they are still in just the less, and they are thinking about growing it to less huge. Mm -hmm. uh, two years later, uh, close to two years later. Very interesting. Okay, so how many how many actually coaches uh, supported this uh, transition, this transformation? I will, I will finish up on the SFPD and then uh, Mark, you can talk oh, about this. Yeah, yeah. It's similar. So for uh, the Governmental Institute of Pensions, um, we started by one. Um, and then we mainly become part of the Scrum Master community. So we are not, um, I, I, we, we generally don't feel well by being called Agile Coach, even though they hire us. We immediately go, we are a Scrum Master um, to, to make sure that we understand there's no hierarchy of coaches. Uh, if we want to detail the organization, then it's not good to have a hierarchy of coaches in your organization. So we immediately go, uh, we are a Scrum Master and then we collaborate with Scrum Masters, internal ones. And we use this kind of tandem principle, principle of coaching. So first we do, and we take some internal person with us to show, and if, we, if they feel like uh, still scared, <laughs> but comfortable enough to go for it, we switch seats. So they are still scared, but they go and we are in the back. So if we, if, if we see, okay, we're falling down, we're going to fall down, we can still put our feet up and move, keep it straight up again. So if this is going well, we just step down. So and this is what we do on different aspects. On organizational level where I started, and on product owner level where I started, then the technical level went became more into the picture, and that's where, for example, for us, Thierry, the PO came in and bit more of the, the technical part. Then it went more into the organizational. I supported this again a bit more. And now today it's being uh, mainly supported really on technical excellence, but also on refinement practices by Olivier, another coach of us. So this is the move. We were, we were never there with, with 20 coaches. Yeah? We used the internal employees and grow skills internally to move forward. Mm -hmm. So the change is also never ending. So we need to grow skills in the organization so that they can continue in this never ending story of uncovering better ways. So we need to bring it in and not too much on external. So this is a SFPD, but where Marcus is a, is a similar, but yet a different story. Go Mark. I, th I think this is about the, the learning organization, right? So we do it for them. They don't learn. So um, like my organization, the same thing, uh, Jürgen, came in basically the first, I think, and organ organizational level and even held back and said, okay, we have to postpone it because you're not ready. <laughs> um, because we're not there to, to have you do less as soon as possible, but to help you with your biggest problem. And then after that, um, with the flip, and, and after the Jürgen helped and Eric helped, and Eric was also the technical coach, so he helped in the technical excellence to set up uh, a lot of improvements there to, to be able to move forward. And after a while, um, I came in as well to more hands-on help the Scrum Masters. 
and also the product owner to move forward and also um, guide them to less huge, right? Um, because they're growing to too many teams. Um, but yeah, basically, I I always say if I do something, I want some of you to join me because then at least you learn or you're able to do it yourself uh, without me, and that's that's kind of important for us because we want the organizations that we help to learn and not mm. we learn as well. So, but, but especially the. Mm -hmm. We are we're being watched live and people started to ask questions, so I have to read one question. Uh, like, why everyone is taunting with Jira or why everybody is making fun of Jira? <laughs> and, uh, oh, All the time. You, and, uh, <laughs> I know Jurgen has a cool script he showed me once which can extract everything from enterprise Jira and put it into an Excel and then you can see everything. But like, What's wrong with Jira? Like, if everybody is still using that, so I have you... I have my answer, but I really would, would like to hear what you guys think and how you can reply to uh, Dimitri, who's watching us. Do you want this the... question? Jira bashing, <laughs> come on. Do you want the blunt, the blunt version from uh, Jurgen or the the nice version <laughs> from me? <laughs> I would have both, maybe even. Eh? So I'll start. I mean, I'm not against. Jira per se, but the problem with, <laughs> <laughs> problem with Jira is it's already too We will be able to cut this apart in our video yeah. reco well, recordings. <laughs> no, um, uh, Jira is too complex by default. So if you would really use just the basic functionality of having the things in the product, in the product backlog there, as a, some sort of tool, some sort of repository, I might be okay with it. Uh, but you can easily do that in like spreadsheet. Um, what's happening right now is that we do everything in Jira. So we do this whole forecasting, we do add a lot of details, people just follow the process instead of talking about it with each other. And, and most harmful of all, I think, is are the sprint backlogs. So if you use Jira as a repository because you need some product backlog, right? So whether you do it in Jira or in a spreadsheet or on the wall with stickies. Um, I mean, okay, if you keep it simple, I'm okay to use some kind of Jira. But what's happening, people have a sprint backlog. So all these teams have a sprint backlog and those are column based. So what they'll do is they just look at it, make like tasks and then start drop dropping them in the Jira thing. Well, what I like and the best teams I saw had a, a sprint backlog on the wall, drawing their actual design. If needed, they put some post-its there and constantly having the conversation about how far are we? Are we still reaching our goal? Do we need to change anything? Everyone understood what's happening. And this sprint backlog thing with all these columns and some even add more columns than the three standard ones and it's even worse. Because usually then they have a tester, so it must be in the test column, uh, which is quite usually a dysfunction of the team. But that that that's really harmful. And and right now, Jira has all these plugins for portfolio management and all this kind of things, which basically, I always say, Jira decreases transparency, while the product backlog is intended to increase transparency. So I hear I hear a few things. Let me just uh, re repeat what I've heard. Uh, first, there is transparency, right? It's so it's it's so it's so hard to understand the overall picture looking into Jira, but it's so much easier if it's on the wall. I understand that. Question: How you do it in a in a everybody's remote environment in a, in the current quarantine right situation? But I understand this goal. Secondly, uh, I think. What you've said, Mark, is that people have this multiple uh, columns and all the sprint planning is then also in Jira, so it feels like it's adding up complexity and it's the opposite of the scaling, right? Yeah. Well, what are the other things like why are we so 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 hateful of that tool, although it might be not the worst tool in the worst? Yeah, I know it's time for the <laughs> I guess. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, if, if you continue now the columns and the tasking out which is happening, I know let's let's focus on the sprint planning there, so not the product backlog yet, uh, but many teams tend to use it in the, in the sprint backlog and they use the uh, remote setting as an excuse. Um, 
even uh, as a remote setting, it's most probably more better to use uh, Miro or Muro or a WAP whiteboard, uh, whatever, things where you can put designs up and where you can add more details if you start executing in it instead of a tasking. But people generally, it's a lot easier to go into sprint planning and task it out in all the details and put this in a board with open whip done. Because then the rest of the sprint, we don't really need to collaborate, you know? Because I know what to do, you know what to do, and the only thing we need to yep. do is move tickets That's around. The task already assigned. <laughs> so this is the easy way. This is the easy way. This is this is this is again resource management, and this is how we tend to use product backlogs as well. They start to order according to the available skills instead of the value or the impact we want to generate. Um, so this is the the urge to go back to the old structures. And Larman, Greg Larman, has this this kind of organizational behavior. So the laws of organizational behavior. So number one is implicitly we don't really want to change. So it's mo most probably in the beginning people want to go back to this kind of leave me alone and let me do my job. So if I task it out and I'm on my own, I can just move tickets around. So instead of truly going to collaboration. So it doesn't really help in that sense. So if you go to more of designs on the walls and you put pictures like we are going to collaborate on this piece here together and we need to more on all collaboration, we get more insights in the solution, which makes it easier to collaborate. Because if you said, I need to do this task, I still don't know how the solution looks like. I know you will code something. Cool. How do I collaborate now in this? I don't know. But if I show you the, the, the design behind it, then I might know how to help you out in this coding. And then we can truly collaborate and swarm around things. So I think this is, a, this is an important aspect. If you go to product backlog, then, uh, then we can yeah. go really nuts. But Mark is asking for attention, so let's give him some attention. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. Yeah, so to, to add something which I just thought, what, what often happens in this kind of things as well, especially in big organizations, um, with this Jira and with all these, and not per se Jira. I mean, it's like I've, I've seen more of these tools, and basically, to me, they're the same, but Jira is most used, so probably everyone says Jira. Um, like these, these product managers or team leads or whatever they're called in big organizations, they say, oh, for your team, which is basically a project in that, in that case, because it's not really a product-focused organization, and they to go totally nuts in this Jira with all kinds of layers of whatever they call it, epics, features, whatever. Uh, and basically, it's requirements up front. And, and writing down in such a tool. And the tool is not the problem, I know. The, the use of the tool is the problem, but the tool helps in creating this problem. So probably that's why a lot of uh, hate yeah. is not uh, I, I also, I also okay. like okay, so have an interesting yeah. thought about Jira and other tools. Like, let's give people opportunity to make the process so much complicated that it used to be. So if, if you have so many buttons, then you can configure the, the process like the way you want. You just build it huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I built a, a Google uh, sheet which uses the Jira API and I reduce Jira to a <laughs> plain database. Okay. So really like I, I don't object if people want to use Jira, go ahead. But I request the, to have access to the Jira API so ca that I can use a, a plain spreadsheet. And I, I love Google Docs because you have Google scripting. It's a bit like JavaScripting, and I'm still an engineer uh, in heart. So I, I love to, to then reduce the, the Jira to, to, a, to just a database. Because as soon as I have the Google Doc, I can show more benefits of the simplification. And then if people start to understand, they see the difference, and they start to feel the difference, then they will start to ignore the Jira as well. So it's not that I will immediately throw it out. I will show better ways. And then if people understand, they will also understand why we bitch about Jira that much. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe, Jurgen, give an example? Like what is it you can see in your spreadsheet, right? After getting data from Jira that it's hard, it's so hard or impossible to see in Jira by itself. Um, one thing that Mark mentioned in uh, in uh, and this thing is this portfolio thing and pre projections towards the future and deadline thing. And Jira is, is generally using some average metric, which is coming from velocity, uh, another ugly word and all that stuff. So, but it's an average thing across many things and you can only see the average projections as well. But if I, uh, if I now as a product owner get a question, yeah, you know, and it's, it's, it's for example, now we are the 3rd of June. And I come to you and I ask you, yeah, you know, Alexi, what will you deliver in September? 
if we now use an average, then most probably you're going to promise way too much. Because July and August are holiday, day, holiday months. So with the Google Doc I created, then the product owner takes into account the context of the question and says, oh, July, August, oh, that's a bit of an issue. Let's tweak it a bit so that we take into account that July and August are holiday months. And then I see what is populating up and then I give a more sensible answer. It will still be wrong, by the way, but at least less wrong than the other one. So this is happening. Another thing that is there, if I give them the sheet, they have something to go in those those meetings where you have the hotshot executives, the hippos coming in and demanding a, a, a kind of feature. You know this, eh? you start somewhere small in an organization and then there's a hotshot manager. I need this by, this by next month. And then you can just say, okay, you know, let's see if you need this. We add it to, the, to this Google Doc. We do a gut feeling, a rough estimate on top of that. And within two minutes, we can show the impact. And we can say, okay, if I comply to your need, this is the impact. Do we, do we now absorb the impact? And not only the impact in the same month, eh, but the impact across the full projection that you have. Mm. And it's like, this is the impact. Do you really want this now? So, and if they say yes, then you can also ask them to join you and explaining all the others that are being impacted by that request to help convince them that it's okay as well. So that it's not your burden alone to carry. And this you do within two minutes. This I think is a benefit you don't really have in, in other things. You also do scenario planning. So, you know, you, you generate a multitude of options as a product owner, and then you see, okay, which one do we feel best with? And we go for this one, unless somebody else overrules you, maybe. Uh, but anyhow, this is kind of scenario planning is also a lot easier in a simple a simple thing than in this complicated Jira. As soon as you do something in Jira, it's also for real. In the Google Doc, you can play around, and it's not necessarily for real. You know, this is fun. <laughs> okay. Sounds like a pretty... Ad Ad advanced way to use the Jira as the database approach. And uh, let's stay um, maybe on the hardcore uh, topics and uh, let's uh, maybe uh, call this uh, webinar today like a hardcore uh, less things, right? So uh, among these four um, among these four complexities that you've mentioned today, Jurgen, there was a vertical, horizontal, spacious, and technical. I think during our previous podcast, we haven't touched much or we haven't discussed discussed much about the last one the technical one yeah and uh, so since you seem to be hardcore engineers and you 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 uh, script uh, and extract data from jira and you do something which sounds quite complicated uh, though but uh, hopefully it's for minimizing right the complexity uh like what's your what's your approach to minimizing the technical complexity because I will, I will give it back to uh, to Mark to, uh, yeah. because we've been talking a lot. But what is, what is the key key factor is you don't address the technical complexity and descale that complexity. It will become a constraint towards your business agility, and this is important. Uh, you can change the organizational structures if you don't take care about the technical one. You will get stuck, mm. and the other way around. So and this how is my do you, to you Mark? <laughs> how do you how do you Mark address the technical uh, complexity? It's probably I don't know is it is actually the hardest one to deal with because it's about code that is there. That's the legacy. It's easy to shuffle teams. Although, like in your examples, it takes half a year to prepare for the flip event. But how about the code? Right? What do you actually do with it? The most difficult. The, the answer is, of course, <laughs> it depends. But usually. It Usually, technical excellence is, is one of the most difficult things in, in many organizations, at least. Not in startups, which just started, with, but in, especially in these long-term organizations that have 100-year history. Uh, but also in organizations a lot, lot shorter because you want to grow and you have component teams and it's usually not a good sign to, to do with um, technical excellence. And, um, I, I wanted to give an example in a non-less environment. So. Uh, um, I, I was a manager in a department with roughly 100 developers, um, which were, we changed into business focus, we really invested a lot in collaboration, cross-functional teams, stuff like that. And then I figured, oh, that we really did that well, the way of working, the better connection to the customer and the user. Um, but then a bit later, I realized that a couple of years before, 
the architecture was a mess. There were a lot of them. No one really knew what how to do it. Was not integrated stuff like that. And they started uh, throwing out the legacy, um, making it better, new technologies. And um, if that wouldn't happen, these teams were never able to become cross-functional and cross-component because it was way too difficult to do. Um, it was never able to release and to integrate fast. Um, so this is really a, a prerequisite to, to, to move forward. Jürgen, you want to say something? Yeah. Both can be triggered. The technical one can be a trigger for the organization and the other way around. For the tele in the telecom industry, billing is the most nutty billing systems that I have seen. Way too many systems, 340 systems just for billing things. It's it's tremendous. It's nuts. Uh, people didn't bother that much about reducing the technical complexity. Why? I need somebody with skill for system way, and you do resource management. So you hire somebody and you throw them away, and that's why you you have a sourcing contract with Tech Mahindra, a huge consultancy organization. Anyhow. So it's easy to just have the skill, throw the skill. But you always need to have the skill educated in the context of your business. So this is a, a loss in that sense. It's not that it's it's a gear, it's gear in a machine that you throw away and put a new gear and it works again. That's not going to happen. Um, in that sense. So when we when we turn it around into less huge, which you already know, what do you get? You get fixed teams, creative teams. And now they are responsible of 340 systems. Everybody goes like, you are nuts, we cannot handle this. Of course not. But you will need to handle it some way. So and they, they are stressed out. And by I think in, in, in about a couple of months or things like that, they decommissioned a couple of systems. So they, they start to see feel the complexity themselves, feel the pain of the complexity. And by design, they start reducing it. So they figured out that some of the systems, what were highly needed, they figured out it's only being used for getters and setters. So basically as a, as a storage. So it's easy to, to move the getters and starters and move it somewhere else as storage and re reduce this, this system, so decommission the system. And at the end, maybe even servers. So by getting into the shared pain, like, like Marco already mentioned in the organization, by having the shared pain, you also reduce this thing. So if you reduce the complexity, you will see that other positions become obsolete in the organization. You will also absorb this. So it's really hand in hand, one without the other. And for me, it's it's... It's uh, it's impossible. Yeah, that's why we in the initial when we start talking to customers then that that want our help, we also do this technical assessment because it might be the biggest problem they have. And I think we even said to I was not involved in that one, but I think we even said to one customer that wanted to do like less or scrum. Now first take care of this because this mess is too big to actually start. Well it's not per se a prerequisite, but that was really a big mess based on the technical assessment. Um, and your biggest problem is that. So if you talk about learning organization, look at what your biggest challenge is and start there. And that might be not doing this multi-team scrum or less or, or, or any time of any way of working, but might be solve your technical issues or get to know your customer better or get a, define your product better. Um, so that that's probably one of the things, but technical excellence is just so such a major skill that, that we're trying to to lean more towards that because that's what company usually need. And microservices are not the solution. <laughs> we will cut this out uh, from the recording too. <laughs> All right, guys, we've uh, spent a bit more than an hour discussing uh, complexity and learning organization. And this is just a warm up yeah, for people who are watching us. That This is a warm up just to give you a bit of a taste of uh, our speakers and what less and less conference will be about. So, Jurgen, you'll be sp speaking, you'll be presenting at our, at our conference, right, which is 15, 16, 17 of June online. And uh, let me read the name of your talk and, and I'll ask you to explain what that means because I don't actually <laughs> understand it. It says, uh, from idea towards a less uh, kaikaku. So what is kaikaku and what are you going to speak about? What are your stories? Because this is a story-based conference. We really would like to hear people sharing some journeys, some examples, some failures, something, right? So um, I'm going to share the journey, especially of two of the organizations we turned around into less initially and then beyond less afterwards. Um, I will also add a third one in which uh, recently started uh, on how a less kaikaku and I think the kaikaku is something which uh, many people have like, ooh, what the hell is this? 
Um, everybody understands Kaizen, like this continuous uh, incremental approach. And many also, uh, many organizations think like, let's let's do the agile, uh, agile adoption as well like this, like incremental iterative. And that's all okay, but it's take a long time. And most probably you don't really touch the strong beliefs. It's always on the surface still and small on the surface and again on the surface. Like if you really want to breach some of the strong beliefs and not take too much time on it, then most probably you need a Kaikaku. Kaikaku is a system change. Mm. So if you look at lean thinking, they say, okay, we can do Kaizen until, until a certain moment. We optimized in the current system and then we need to swap the system around and then do Kaizen again to improve. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what we, 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 we say with the Kaikaku. I also see from experience now, so all the decades that I've been there and the many uh, organizations I support, I see this is a success factor of sustainable change, to be honest. So we prepare for the Kaikaku and the preparation phase is very important. You already heard about this as well from Mark. We prepare for the Kaikaku and then we really have a Kaikaku event. Two days, three days, four days, five days, you will see the differences and why the differences are there. And then after the Kaikaku, we basically, before the Kaikaku, you will work in old structures and after the Kaikaku, you work in a less structure. So this is, and then you go again with continuous improvement. Mm. So, but this is uh, this is the idea, and we compare case studies. I'm not going to talk myself as a as a scrum master, external scrum master, or consultant, or whatever you want to call me, going into organization. I will kickstart this and give you some insights from the different things, and then I will allow the people that actually went lift through this change talk by themselves. So we have somebody, Great. we have Jordi joining me from the organization as an employee, living through it, and we have Tom, one of the Scrum Master of the Governmental Institute, for example, living through it and being a real driver. Um, so they will, I hopefully, do more of the talking than I do. Hmm. I cannot uh, leave you uh, without asking this question. You, you just mentioned one thing which like uh, shook me a bit, like you, you, you said you evolved towards less and beyond less. So what's what's like is is there life uh, beyond less, less? less huge and then you go from less less huge to the huge less huge and <laughs> okay this <laughs> is last time right so you mean like just bigger bigger no, it means you absorb more and more like right. the organization mark is in we start kick started this with seven teams uh, mm -hmm. today they have 13 teams working on one backlog Wow. So this is becoming very painful and now they are figuring out on how to go to less huge. Mm -hmm. But they still have 13 teams on one backlog. So you keep going until it hurts too much. And that's the moment when you add more complexity again. So you stop descaling the organization. That's when you say, okay, you know what? We need to add a bit more to lower the 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 pain level and figure out ways to work again. So but you know. Cool. This uh, is beyond less that's what we mean less is never done right yeah no all right guys i think it's a great note to finish our recording for today again people who are watching us or will be watching us in a recording it's a warm-up for a less conference less day europe 2020 15 16 17 june Online, you can still uh, buy tickets or at least help us uh, promote this event. If you are in this in these topics, we're not going to discuss less frameworks or less rules. We will be hearing people like uh, Jurgen and Mark today sharing their experiences with actually simplifying organization. So we think we think that we will be one of the coolest event this year to attend uh, from home. Right. Yeah. Um, Thank, Thank you, guys, you guys for being with us today. We cheers wish to that. you a great evening. Yeah. Uh, cheers to everyone. Um, yeah. Bye. All, all the best. Let's keep learning and let's keep simplifying and let's 